Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Wendy Hunter Barker. I'm the Assistant Dean here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, and we're very pleased to welcome you to the first in our webinar series, Global Impacts of COVID-19. Today's session is on U.S.-China relations. Here to welcome you is our Dean, Peter Cowie. Uh, welcome virtually to the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. Um, this is uh, a seminar where the main attraction are my colleagues uh, who are truly expert on the subject of today. Uh, but uh, like public radio, there is a brief public service announcement at the beginning of this event. And it's about the school itself for the many of you who are joining us who are not uh, traditionally uh, attendees of events at the school. So the School of Global Policy and Strategy uh, is over 30 years old, and it is distinctive because over 30 years ago, it made a strategic prediction about the future on which it acted. And that prediction was simply that as the 21st century emerged, the world's fulcrum point for dynamics, the things that would shape the entire world even from a specific point, was that the fulcrum point would shift from the Atlantic, the intersection of the Americas and Europe, to the Pacific, the intersection of the Americas and Asia. And from that insight, we built both deeply about expertise on the countries and economies of the Pacific region, but we also built deeply about understanding how global dynamics would change in the 21st century as a result of that shift in the fulcrum point. This series really reflects the payoff of 30 years of stellar research by our faculty and an innovative curriculum and education system for our professional graduate students, who I would commend to your attention if you happen to be employers. And it will take us through both the particulars of how countries in the region have responded. It will take us through the intersection of those countries and their policies in diplomacy. It will take us to look at the global impact, whether it's on global economics or the way that the labor force of the future will operate or how education will change in the future as a result of yet another factor on which we have focused, namely the intersection of science and technology developments with the world of economics and public affairs. So I hope that you'll enjoy and profit from this intellectual adventure and our mission of public service. It's great to have you with us. We look forward to you being with us when we can gather in person, not just digitally. And with that, let me turn this over to my colleague, Victor, and he will take you from there. Thanks, Peter, and thank you, Wendy, for organizing this series of webinars. Uh, hope that you're going to be able to join us for all of them. Uh, so let me introduce the panel very quickly. Uh, our first speaker is Professor Deborah Seligson, uh, who's an assistant professor of political science at Vill Villanova University. Uh, her research focuses on Chinese politics, uh, US-China relations, and energy and environmental policies. Um, you know, perhaps more importantly for today's purposes, uh, she, well, and, and of course she received her PhD here at UCSD, uh, but for today's purpose, um, also prior to her academic career, she had over 20 years experience in the U.S. State Department uh, working on science environmental issues uh, in China, India, Nepal, and New Zealand. Uh, with her most recent position being the Environmental Science, Technology, and Health Counselor in the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Uh, so we look forward to her commentaries. Um, I, as many of you know, I am the uh, Hong Miu Lam Chair Associate Professor here at GPS. Uh, my study, my research is on elite politics and political economy of finance in China. Uh, and prior to coming to UCSD, uh, I dabbled in finance for a couple of years <laughs> in the Carlisle Group. Uh, last but certainly not least uh, is Susan Shirk, who's the research professor and chair of the 21st Century China Center. She's author of numerous very influential work in the China field, 
uh, including uh, the political logic of economic reform in China, as well as China, a fragile superpower. Also, um, she spent some time as a policymaker as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State between 1997 and 2000 um, for obviously China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Mongolia uh, affairs. So, uh, this is going to be a great panel. Our first speaker is Professor Seligson. So Debbie, why don't you begin? Thank you so much, Victor. It's a real honor for me to be here speaking, at least in my on my screen, right between my two professors. So thank you. Um, I want to take everybody back to SARS because um, SARS was actually a searing experience in my own life personally and in the life of the Chinese nation, I think. I was living in China when SARS started and took over as the science counselor in Beijing in the middle of the SARS epidemic. And I think a lot of the lessons learned from SARS have influenced everything that's happened during COVID-19, some of those lessons being really useful and some of those lessons perhaps sending people a little bit in the wrong directions, um, not just in China, but in other countries around the world. So the first lesson from SARS was that cover-ups are a really bad idea, right? SARS started in late 2002 in Guangzhou, and, or in Guangdong at least, and it was clear down there that there was a real problem, which they didn't acknowledge until maybe February 2003. They then sort of presented it as a South China only problem. And while as an expat in Beijing, we were already preparing and there was temperature testing at the international schools by sometime in March, the public in Beijing was not warned that the disease was already in Beijing until April 20th. And what was striking was on April 20th, 2003, the Chinese government announced the problem had spread to Beijing. They fired the health minister, they fired the Beijing party secretary, and the public just turned on a dime. And even people who had been always, to me, somewhat skeptical of the Chinese government, prior to that had really paid no attention to the epidemic. And on that day went into panic mode, got their um, masks started scrubbing their hands to the bone and all of that. So first of all, the importance of government messaging, regardless of the type of government, was really brought home to me in a big way. But then the next thing that happened is that's when the Chinese government started welcoming international cooperation. And there were just dozens of WHO-led teams that came into China to advise on how to do real epidemiology, contact tracing, case identification, all the stuff that has now become part of the popular discourse in the United States and around the world. Um, before that, the Chinese had done a lot of things on public health, but that is not what they had done. They had done things more like getting clean water and clean food to the public, um, vaccination programs, that kind of thing. But actually tracing out a novel disease, tracing outbreaks had not been a strength. So they learned a lot from that experience and the US learned that we really needed closer cooperation. CDC members were a big part of all those WHO teams and we decided to expand with a number of new programs. So that's when we brought in this field epidemiology training program that trained most Chinese epidemiologists over the next decade plus. That's when we, and that is really special because the person who heads that is, was an American who actually sat in the China CDC. That's when we created this emerging infectious disease program, which at its height had at least a half dozen Americans and over, I don't know, 30 or 40 um, Chinese staff working for it in Beijing. We were working together very closely. We expanded our CDC cooperation, our NIH cooperation, FDA then came in, USAID set up this program that was specifically out there collecting viruses in the field, including coronaviruses. This all started under President Bush and was all supported and in some cases expanded under President Obama. And it all started to fall apart in the current administration. The CDC is now down to one or two Americans in Beijing, a handful of local hires from 
10 to 12 and over 40 by the end of the Obama administration. Um, that USAID program that was out there collecting coronaviruses was canceled last year. The FETP program where they were actually sitting in the C CDC was canceled. And so I think when this thing started, there was a real lack of faith on the part of the Chinese that the US was there to support it. And I think that's an important message that often gets lost. But regardless of that, on January 3rd, the China CDC called the US CDC, spoke to the director, Robert Redfield, and told him about the disease. And Redfield was concerned enough to immediately call HHS Secretary Alex Azar. And Azar was concerned enough to immediately try to get an appointment with the president, which it took him 15 days to get. So China warned the WHO at the end of December. They told us in early January. And other countries, including Germany, including most of East Asia, began responding right away, getting those hand washing campaigns out, getting some social distancing. But the big lesson of SARS that got overlearned for the beginning of COVID was with SARS, only symptomatic people were spreaders. Whereas with COVID, it turns out that asymptomatic people are spreaders. And we still have no idea what percentage of people that are infected are asymptomatic. But it's clear that the disease was seeded much earlier than anyone imagined in Europe, in North America, and nobody was looking for it. SARS, because it was symptomatic, it was much easier to track cases and do contact tracing. It hit some cities and not others. Beijing was hit hard, Shanghai was not, Toronto was hit hard, New York was not. So it was much more um, scattered. And that's what people were expecting with this disease as well. So there were a lot of expectations that turned out not to be true. But the one thing that we do know is that our close cooperation in the past actually made a huge difference. And the real question now is how can we get back to that because there's a lot more work to be done. Okay, um, so I guess I'll comment very quickly on um, some of the potential domestic political implications. Um, so I think China, uh, in terms of notifying uh, sort of inter foreign authorities probably did um, you know what it was supposed to do at least the Chinese CDC domestically though um, you know in terms of notifying Chinese citizens uh, there was a delay um, as well documented by Tsai Xin um, because of this uh, institutionally within the Chinese Communist Party all information is supposed to flow upward first at first and then uh, on important information such as a potential pandemic, the central authorities are supposed to decide whether or not to inform the public about it. This was the problem, uh, I gather, you know, during SARS also, uh, and it was once again a problem this time. Uh, interestingly, you know, so that for a while people began to question, well, whether this delay and the fact that the disease spread so heavily in Wuhan and in the rest of Hubei, whether that would jeopardize Xi Jinping's uh, position in the party. Uh, and on top of that, he of course disappeared from public view for something like a week in late January and early February. Uh, it turns out that um, he probably most likely still is very firmly in control of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and I'll tell you, you know, some of the indicators we've seen. Nonetheless, uh, it seems that he uh, has taken at least a step or two, or two toward sharing a bit more power as a result of the coronavirus. Um, so for one thing, um, starting in late January, uh, instead of just holding Politburo meetings, which is sort of a lower level body uh, where he had more control, more agenda power, uh, to discuss and decide on very important decisions uh, or leading group uh, meetings, which of course him being the head of, you know, virtually every single leading groups in China, he of course drove the agenda for all the leading groups. Uh, instead of that, we began to see very high profile coverage of Politburo standing committee meetings, 
Uh, there was one just yesterday emphasizing on uh, reviving the economy. Uh, therefore, at least sort of symbolically, and I, I actually think somewhat substantially, giving his colleagues, his Polyvero Standing Committee colleagues, a higher profile in both sharing the responsibility, but also the power of uh, running the country of China more so than he had done prior to the coronavirus, you know, because he, he had been trying to totally dominate the policy process prior to uh, the beginning of January. So that's one thing. And on top of that, of course, Li Keqiang uh, became the head of the leading group on fighting against the coronavirus, uh, where he remains the head of the leading group. Uh, and that, you can argue, is the first very important leading group that was headed by someone other than Xi Jinping himself. Uh, and of course, the, that leading group is not just a state council leading group, which of course can be headed by Li Keqiang and other st uh, state council vice premiers. This was a high profile party leading group. Uh, nonetheless, I, I would argue that it seems that Xi Jinping very much remains in charge. Uh, and if you look at the promotion, which and, and the removal of officials, which to me is always the strongest indication of you know, who's in charge in the party. Uh, <clears throat> we've seen the removal of Jiang Chaoliang from the Hubei party secretary position. Uh, Jiang Chaoliang, widely rumored to be a close follower of Wang Qishan, replaced by Ying Yong, uh, someone who has, had worked with Xi Jinping uh, in Zhejiang province. Um, also, uh, Xia Baolong, who should have retired because he's about the age of 65, was brought back from semi-retirement at the NPC to serve as the head of the Hong Kong Macau office. Uh, and then the head of the Hong Kong liaison office, Lo Hui Ning, uh, you know, someone not, who did not work directly with Xi Jinping, but someone uh, who was close to Zhao Le Ji, who's a core member of Xi Jinping's faction. Uh, two new vice secretaries of Shanghai also seems to have some ties of Xi's faction. Uh, uh, Liao Guoxuan overlapped with Li Zhangshu in Guizhou province, while Gong Zheng uh, served in Zhejiang province, uh, overlapped with Xi Jinping. Uh, although he, he also has some ties of Zhong Ji. So, so you have these appointments that are really not showing that other factions like Hu Jintao's Renmin factions, uh, Wang Qishan's faction, as having uh, a lot of say in these new appointments. So uh, I would say even though there's been some signs of sharing power a bit more than before, uh, she very much uh, remains in charge. Um, so very quickly about some of the economic things. A couple of things I would, I would uh, you know, I think matters to the rest of the world as we're dealing with the coronavirus is that it has been very difficult even though uh, the pandemic, had, you can say in some sense, has passed in China for Chinese economic activities to revive. So it's taken a very, very long time. And this is a country with a lot of planned economy too. So the government literally ordered these enterprises to resume production. Yet, if you look at electricity output data and other data sources, it's not back at 100%, not, not by a long stretch. The other thing is that the consumers really cut down on their consumption, certainly during the height of the coronavirus, but even these days. And this is something that the rest of the world will have to go through. So I think there's just kind of this optimism, you know, especially among some politicians, you know, here in the US that, oh, it's gonna be V-shaped, you know, when the day that the, the virus passes, it's the day that American consumers will go back and spending the exact same amount of money that they had spent before from what we are seeing uh, in China, but not just in China, but also Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, that is not what is happening. That will most likely not going to happen here. Uh, so, so China provides a lesson for that. So, um, so these are my uh, comments. I guess I'll hand things off to Susan. Well, thank you, Victor and Debbie, um, I'll be talking about US-China relations. The COVID-19 pandemic has been a test of the US-China relationship. And it saddens me to say that the relationship has failed this test. Instead of coordinating efforts against the common threat of the 
this terrible disease, the two countries have been criticizing and blaming one another. So why is that? I mean, to most of us on this call, it see, would seem just so obvious that a, a global threat like a pandemic deserves a global solution and that the only sensible pragmatic thing to do is for the two largest economies in the world to coordinate their efforts. But in fact, instead, what we see is that the political leaders of both countries have been defending themselves against public cr criticism of their own performance, how they mishandled, especially the early stages of the epidemic, by diverting blame to the other country. And then the subordinates in these administrations have joined in or uh, chimed in uh, in order to prove their loyalty to the leader, going often going even further than what the leaders have to say about that. And um, that shows that really despite the complete differences in our political systems, it seems like it's all about loyalty in both the Xi and the Trump administrations. Uh, now to Xi Jinping, the eruption of public anger and sadness about people dying in Wuhan in the initial days of this uh, information cover, cover up in Wuhan and Hubei province uh, during uh, the end of December and early January when the Communist Party was holding uh, its meetings in Hubei province and they didn't want any bad news. That's always the way things work in China. Uh, and meanwhile, people were not told anything about this disease. And uh, therefore, when uh, Dr. Li Wen Liang uh, one of the doctors who tried to ring the fire alarm about the disease only to be disciplined by uh, the public security forces, um, people just erupted in fury and in sadness. And that, to Xi Jinping, looked like a, a, a kind of a repeat of the 1989 Tiananmen crisis, which of course involved demonstrations in more than 130 cities, and it really looked like a potential threat to party rule. So then when, uh, and that then coincides with Xi Jinping himself, actually, apparently he knew about it because later on there's a publication of a speech that he gave in Beijing to internal speech in which he uh, directed people for how to deal with the disease, uh, even though at the time the public was not being informed. So the fact of the matter is that, at least according to the Chinese own account, really, of these speeches, Xi Jinping was part of the cover-up in the early days of January. Um, so, uh, but then when the party's aggressive social policing and the actions to quarantine those who had tested positive for the disease and put them away from their families so they wouldn't infect their families, which uh, I think is going to turn out to be an important part of the uh, potential solution to uh, controlling the spread, and of course, it's something that we are not doing in the United States. Um, but when China got on top of the spread of the disease, um, just at a time when European countries and here in America, we were kind of floundering in the early days, um, they launched this massive propaganda campaign to celebrate the superiority of their own system, and uh, how much better it was than our messy market democracies, and to spread an absolutely outrageous conspiracy theory that the US Army had brought the disease to Wuhan. So that was their pretty feeble efforts to um, defend themselves against what was being said in the United States about blaming China for starting, letting everything start, 
in Wuhan, um, but it, uh, and in fact, even it's kind of the big lie, it seems like it doesn't pass the red face test to us, but apparently many people in China and other parts of the world now believe that. Now on the US side, of course, President Trump is also in the middle of a reelection campaign. So that makes him particularly sensitive to criticism of his own performance. And he's tried to divert attention um, by blaming China, uh, calling it the China virus. Others like Secretary of State Pompeo actually scuttled a G7 agreement on the pandemic just because the European countries and uh, Japan wouldn't call it the Wuhan virus. Now, this looks ridiculously petty and short-sighted at a time that we now really need to be working together. Um, while this tit for tat uh, name calling and blaming was, has been going on, looks like playground fights to, to me, um, the disease was spreading people are dying. And there are political roadblocks in the way of transferring personal protective equipment and ventilators from China, which now has a big surplus. And we need this stuff to save lives. Individuals and companies and some um, organizations in the United States, like the Committee of 100, have used their personal networks to do this. but our government has been putting roadblocks. Uh, gov our government and the Chinese government, I would say, have put roadblocks in the way of having this smooth flow of materials. Uh, the United States still has tariffs on some of this medical equipment, which is just shocking. Um, and the FDA only last Friday agreed to accept equipment that meets the standards of the Chinese uh, CDC or FDA, their authorities. So um, it's obvious that infectious diseases are global challenges that need global solutions. And uh, as Debbie Seligson has said, the United States and China have managed to cooperate in the past, not just with SARS, but H1N1, uh, H, seven and nine in 2013, Ebola in Africa in 2014. Um, but this time, you know, I think it's quite revealing about the state of US-China relations have become so hostile, filled with so much uh, mutual suspicion at, at the political level and increasingly at the mass level too, that it's been impossible so far to really have the kind of pragmatic cooperation that's needed and will be needed uh, to mobilize the massive international effort that we're going to need to develop, test, and distribute therapies and vaccines for COVID-19. You know, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States, beginning in uh, 1966, together jointly led a global effort to vaccinate more than a billion people in the 31 effective countries that had smallpox. And these two Cold War um, uh, enemies managed to work together to eradicate smallpox from the globe. So why shouldn't the United States and China be able to do this now? We need, uh, we need, we're gonna need to do this. We're gonna need to work together to help the developing world. We're gonna need to talk about how we're gonna handle the second and third waves that will return. Um, and we need to learn from the experience of the Chinese clinicians who were the first to treat the disease. So um, that's why we at 21st Century China Center, working with colleagues at Asia Society and others, issued this bipartisan statement last week of 
oh, uh, almost 100 former officials and China hands who are calling for this kind of pragmatic uh, cooperation between the United States and China. And I, wa I want to add with one last thought, which is not only are, do our two countries need to uh, grow up and pragmatically cooperate with one another, but this kind of hostile, increasingly hostile relationship between the two countries is also incredibly costly on two fronts I just want to flag. One is um, science. You know, the scientists, uh, Chinese, American, and scientists from other countries have been working very hard right now to come up with uh, the basic science and the vaccines and the therapies we need. And it just reminds us how important it is to have kind of borderless science and that we should not put political obstacles in the way of scientific cooperation based on political mistrust between, the between countries. And last, that look at what's happened in the United States in terms of um, the blaming China has led to terrible violence and discrimination against Chinese Americans. Uh, Chinese Americans are really, um, uh, have been victimized by the increasingly hostile relationship between the two countries. So that will be a, a, a tremendous cost to America's civil rights and open societies if we allow that to continue. So that's, uh, so go and read our statement on the 21st Century China Center website. And uh, I hope that everyone will, in their own way, do whatever they can to uh, facilitate cooperation between our two countries uh, in order to save lives. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Susan. At this point, we have a little less than half an hour Q&A. Please use your Q&A box to type in your question, uh, try to make it short. And also please uh, address it to one of us or all of us and be specific about that. So the first question we have already is from Ricardo Tavares, uh, who's on our GPS International Advisory Board. His question is that Chinese diplomats are more aggressive in responding to right-wing populists around the world, sometimes with the same tools, as you mentioned, Susan, uh, with the fake news accusation of US Army being responsible for the virus, Twitter is the new channel for that. The news style uh, was already present, but has become more pronounced in this crisis. It feels like Chinese diplomats are more assertive to account for the current share of Chinese economic and military power in the world. Do we expect this uh, aggressive style of uh, outward diplomacy using uh, channels like Twitter to stay? Uh, or do you uh, think that this is just during this uh, COVID um, period? Well, it, it started before the epidemic um, as the foreign ministry kind of unleashed its ambassadors and others to uh, pursue public diplomacy in this new way. I mean, I guess, you know, they figure if people in other countries can do it, they can do it too. But um, so really it's a matter of whether or not the Chinese government decides to restrain those people or not. Now it's easier in China to restrain them. If they wanted to restrain them, they can do that. It's much harder in the United States or other countries for us to restrain politicians in this way. But an encouraging sign is that Ambassador Sui Tiankai, uh, who's the Chinese ambassador in Washington, he spoke out in an interview uh, that said, actually beginning back in January, he said that this whole conspiracy theory about the US starting it was absolutely crazy. And he repeated that and pretty much, and he said, I am the authoritative representative of the Chinese government in Washington. 
So he made clear that that's the Chinese government position. Great. Second question is from Rick Carew. Uh, hi, Rick. How do you do? Uh, it's for me. <laughs> it says, what role uh, has Wang Qishan played in China's response effort, given ex his experience in handling the SARS uh, crisis? Um, so as far as I know, I have not seen very much. I mean, um, we, we saw him sort of in the corner of a picture recently uh, as the whole, I think the whole Politburo went like planting some trees or something like that with, with a bunch of, uh, you know, shovels and stuff like that. So he, he's not out of power in the sense that, you know, he already was kind of out of power, not being in the Politburo Standing Committee, but still uh, holding a position in the Foreign Affairs Leading Group, presumably. Not seen him playing a high-profile role, um, and net net, I would I would think that his influence uh, has decreased because of the coronavirus, because of the removal of Jiang Chaoliang, one of his key and most successful, I would say, uh, followers, uh, who is still in the Chinese government. He is now, I think, in the National People's Congress holding some kind of position that's, you know, far from being the party secretary of Hubei. So that's what I would say. Uh, next question from Peter Gorovich uh, for Susan. Why are they, they presumably meaning the U.S. and China, behaving like kids? We need cooperation. Why is that not happening? Is it the leaders who are playing domestic playing two domestic constituencies by bashing the other? Or is it the country's uh, what constituencies would support restraint? Well, that's a wonderful classic Peter Gurvich question about coalitions of social groups. Um, it seems to me that uh, there are many constituencies that would support cooperation. And of course, the masses of the public would support cooperation the, if they thought about it because of how necessary it is to save lives. Um, so it's not just uh, President Trump and party secretary Xi Jinping, um, but it's politicians, it's certainly in the United States, it's broader than President Trump himself. Um, and members of his administration have gone even further than he has at um, suggesting, for example, that, well, one good thing about uh, COVID was maybe American companies will return from China and come back to the United States. Um, other kind of cheap shots at a time that China was really in the throes of the uh, epidemic. I think that uh, it, it shows that there's so much mutual suspicion now that politicians in the Democratic Party, as well as the Republican Party, um, feel that they look strong and the public will support them if they can take China as a foil and to uh, talk about the China threat. And of course, our countries are more competitive with one another than we have been in the past. And it's also true that China's policies have really changed a lot, not just under Xi Jinping, but actually going back to the global financial crisis. So um, there are good reasons for the two countries to be frustrated and angry with one another. We have real disputes, um, but uh, to exploit that now, at a time when the common threat is so much greater is a great sign of um, immaturity really on the part of the political class, I would say, in both countries. Uh, so I'm actually gonna jump to a question by Jonathan Sign, which would be good for Debbie to answer. And then we'll, we'll tackle the question of globalization and what's gonna happen to it uh, next. So Derek Scissors at AEI, you know, uh, the well-known epidemiologist, I'm, I'm being totally sarcastic here, <laughs> recently calculated that China has at floor level 3 million infections. Do you think this uh, Chinese statistics are reliable? I mean, official Chinese statistics, of course, is much lower, 80,000, something like that. 
um, on the spread of coronavirus. Second, might managing statistics play a role in geopolitical posturing uh, by demonstrating how superior the CCP system is? So a couple of things. I mean, first of all, no one's statistics anywhere in the world except maybe Iceland are reliable. Everybody is undercounting the number of cases and everybody knows that they're undercounting, right? That most people, not only most people who are asymptomatic, but most people who have what um, the New York Times reporter who originally called it mild and now regrets it because it sounds like the worst flu of your life. Most of those people who stay at home are not diagnosed either. We know in places from Wuhan to Milan that people also died at home without ever being diagnosed. So even the number of deaths which is a better number because over time it's gotten better. But even that, if you go back to January, February, and in the case of Italy into March, you're undercounting. So we know there's undercounting absolutely everywhere. We also know that when you have a novel virus that isn't yet identified, as was the case in December in Wuhan, and then you don't even have a genome or a test until the middle of January, that it's gonna be extremely spotty who you're counting and who you're not counting. And then we know that there are all these asymptomatic individuals, which the only country that's done any sort of community level testing is Iceland. And so these estimates are based on a population that doesn't have a whole lot to do with the population of China in terms of demographics or anything else. Um, arguments about the number of people who are asymptomatic seem to range from 75% to 25% of total number of cases. So any of these estimates are just wildly, they're a wild guessing game we're going to have better data later. And that's true from everywhere. Because first of all, there are a bunch of antigen tests that are coming out on the market. So we'll be able to test for who's been exposed. And that's gonna be an important part of the get back to work plan because we're gonna be able to figure out who has already had the disease and is safe in a workplace. So the Chinese have as much incentive as everybody else to run those tests and figure out who those people are. So we're gonna get a better better numbers that way. And then frankly, for everywhere from Wuhan to New York to Milan, the only way we're ever going to get the accurate death figures is going to be to look at excess deaths over this period. Because there's also, I mean, there are all kinds of crazy epidemiological things. Apparently, the Chinese have traditionally, if someone died of pneumonia but had an underlying heart condition, they've always attributed that to a heart condition and not pneumonia. And that's not that's about actually, I think, trying to get people to focus on chronic disease within their system um, because they come from a public health, clean the water type of tradition. And it's an aging society where we have to worry about heart disease. So there are a lot of reasons why the data is lousy right now. The bigger question is covering up future cases. Right, so now they have tests, now they've been contact tracing, now they've gotten the numbers lower. And we have two incentives that are running in equal and opposite directions. So we have this incentive that we saw after SARS for local health officials to show their Gigi Xing, right? Show how enthusiastically they're implementing policy by testing and catching obscure diseases. And we've already seen that. We saw a report out of Yunnan of a single hantavirus case where they tested 36 people on a bus us, even though hantavirus is spread by mice and I don't think the mice were on the bus. So we're going to see a lot of that, of officials just looking really enthusiastic. That's the way they caught H5N1 and H5N3 in 2004, 2005, and maybe 2006, right? They were really geared up. They were really focused. And I think one of the sad stories of the start of COVID is that they relaxed a little over time. So we're, so there's an incentive to catch cases, but there's also an incentive since um, the Chinese government kind of declared success to show that you're being successful. So that's pulling in the other direction. I think part of the way local officials are squaring the difference right now is by blaming foreigners for all new cases, because then you can catch the cases, but you can also not look like you failed to do your job. If 
they're big outbreaks and they haven't reported cases, we'll know that the data isn't right because they're going to start doing social distancing again. They have no choice. So I don't think there's any chance of a sort of early January like cover up going on for very long because they know how bad this is and they're going to have to do the social distancing. But I really do think the real data is going to, the real numbers for everybody are going to come out over a period of years as epidemiolog epidemiologists do their job. Uh, great. Um, so we have a, a few questions on the impact of the coronavirus on globalization, especially given that we were still, we are still in the middle of a trade war <laughs> between the U.S. and China. Uh, Susan and, and also Debbie, uh, what, what do you expect, uh, which direction do you expect globalization to take? I mean, is it going to be better than last year in terms of, you know, the U.S. relaxing some of the trade restrictions or the same or worse than last year? What, what do you expect? Well, um, people in the United States, uh, businesses have called for a uh, a truce in the trade war and uh, a temporary or permanent elimination of all the Trump tariffs, which are an extra burden on our businesses that are already struggling from the pandemic. So um, we're going to uh, have to we are very focused even now on how we can help our economy recover after the worst of the first wave is passed. And um, the Trump tariffs are just dragging down the businesses. So it would seem, again, if this is our primary goal, is our own self-interest and our own recovery, that we would maybe even at least temporarily lift the tariffs. Um, but uh, President Trump has indicated that he's very much opposed to doing that. Um, I'd say that there are two, again, two tendencies in terms of the interdependence between the United States and China that will be heightened because of the pandemic. On the one hand, everybody has discovered how dependent we are on China uh, their production of uh, medicines, as well as this medical equipment. So uh, the health of Americans depends on the ability to import these things from China. And just like many other products, uh, China has become the source of a lot of our, the things we use on a daily basis or in an emergency like this epidemic. That makes us very uncomfortable. It makes us very uncomfortable also because China does have a tendency to, um, to use that kind of market leverage it has to try to get countries on the, to say good things about their policies and say good things about Chinese Communist Party rule in China. And when people criticize China, or um, take a different position on Taiwan or South China Sea or Xinjiang or Tibet, they tend to um, withhold products in order to punish them. So that makes China not a very trustworthy partner in having normal trade. So there's a reason that we're uncomfortable with that kind of dependence. On the other hand, I'd say the pandemic does make a lot of us realize how we have to find a way to get along with this country, even though we have very different political systems, we object to many of their policies, but there are big uh, common challenges like pandemics, like climate change, where we just have to hold our noses and find ways of getting along. So I'd say the polls go both directions. Abby, chime in. So Victor, I think one of the things is that 
Um, we know that resiliency in terms of dealing with any disaster involves setting up redundancies. And so I think companies are probably going to think about diversifying their supply chains. That doesn't necessarily have anything to do with setting up more production in the US, although maybe for PPE and ventilators it does. But I think companies are going to be looking at Vietnam, they're going to be looking at Mexico, they're going to be thinking about how to have more than one source for things that they need. Um, the next pandemic could come from anywhere, right? I mean, just because SARS and COVID came from China, MERS came from the Middle East, Zika from South America. So I think a greater awareness of the need for resiliency and redundancy is going to be an important part of lessons moving forward. I would say one thing I think to think about in terms of US-China is after the 2008 crash, I saw a real change in Chinese economic officials and economists' attitudes towards the United States that you no longer have a whole lot of lessons to teach us. Um, looks like you have as many problems of your own. And I think when it comes to public health, that's going to be a bit of the lesson that's being learned right now is you lecture us, but it looks like you also have things you need to learn. And I think we could use that in all of these spheres to be a little more humble and realize that we probably have things to learn from each other. And certainly, as Susan said, that's enormously true on the scientific front. And I think one of the things that's really depressed cooperation at the moment, even though there's a lot of eagerness at the person to person level, is the fact that we have become so focused on this idea of stealing secrets that it makes it very difficult to do normal cooperation. And so I also would hope that we would re-examine areas like health where that usually is not the main issue and um, narrower focus in terms of what, what actually is a risk and what isn't. Because as Susan said, we need to work together. Yeah, I mean, my quick take on the globalization issue, uh, and I agree with Susan, basically, that it, it doesn't, obviously, I, I don't think it hurts it uh, any more than the trade war <laughs> has hurt it already. But like the trade war, it's placing a kind of a ceiling to the extent of globalization. So globalization is, was uh, all about really trying to find the cheapest and most reliable producer for a given part you know, even for very complex machineries like a car or airplanes or something like that all over the world. And uh, both because of geopolitical concerns and, and also this, this uh, discovery that you need to have your own sort of medical supplies and medicine, some autonomy and some, some of that stuff is placing a ceiling on this search for the, the cheapest, you know, producer in the world. There was a, there's also a question out there on uh, One Belt, One Road. Um, the only thing I would say about that is that uh, China can take advantage of this, of course, to form some kind of economic block among the One Belt, One Road countries. The problem is that many of these countries are already highly indebted with a lot of international debt. So what China would need to do to increase these countries' dependence on Chinese produced goods is to give them a lot of renminbi-denominated trade credit that they will take and, and use specifically to buy goods from China. But then the problem is that these countries will build up even more external debt uh, to a point that they may not become viable economies like Venezuela, right? So. Uh, so that it's a challenge for China. Of course, China is going to try to do that. Um, there's a great question to running down on time. So I'm just going to be a bit selective here for Susan from uh, Cheng Li Xin, one of our uh, 21CC board members, of course, uh, says, Susan, as you recognize current toxic atmosphere is hurting Chinese Americans. Do you have specific ideas on what we should do jointly to avoid further risk to Chinese Americans in the US, considering that US-China relationship is not going to improve anytime soon? Well, uh, I don't have any specific ideas. I think it is important 
for Americans more generally to understand how long Chinese Americans have been in America, how they are, you know, legitimately American, just like everyone else uh, who are American citizens. I mean, it is a little bit like the suspicion against Muslims after 9-11, um, but it's different in that now there's a, you know, every, what it means is that every time American politicians vilify China in an extreme way, this resonates into the more racist element in our own society who then turn against Chinese Americans. So, um, you know, I think we just have to strengthen our concern about protecting the civil rights of all Americans, and in fact, all people here, because it's not just Chinese Americans. Some of these people are Chinese citizens, but they are in the United States. There are students, they may be working here, they have green cards or some other kind of uh, way of being here in America. And, you know, um, so uh, I would hope that the federal government would make a bit more of an effort to protect the civil rights of Chinese Americans. Instead of what we see is the Justice Department and many other federal agencies have been trying to, in the quest, this kind of counter espionage effort, it's ended up actually putting a cloud of suspicion over Chinese Americans even before we had the epidemic. Yeah, I would add that, you know, I, I think at the federal level, obviously it's kind of a disaster, <laughs> you know, from the White House. At the local level, you have seen a lot of local leaders coming out to speak up, yeah. uh, you know, against racism in favor of China, the role of Chinese Americans in society. And I would also add that this is a great opportunity for the Chinese government and even for Xi Jinping himself to come out and really, um, you know, launch a propaganda campaign against racism in China, right? So as you know, uh, once these quarantines have been instituted, there's been a lot of, you know, almost racist attitude against foreigners in China. Um, you know, even though at the leadership level, there's been a lot of, you know, just flying aid and stuff like that to different countries, uh, you know, China can, if China wants to take this opportunity to, to really become a symbolic sort of normative leader in the world, it has to tackle this issue of a lot of racism within Chinese society and how much the Chinese government controls the media, it can really launch, uh, you know, a very powerful campaign against racism in China, um, you know, against different kinds of foreigners. Uh, so I'll squeeze one more question here from Tom Gold and uh, some other people asking about Taiwan, um, which is that uh, Taiwan has gotten very positive publicity, at least in the U.S. for its handling of crisis, much of it based on lessons learned from SARS, uh, which was exacerbated by Beijing freezing Taiwan out of the WTO. Uh, this is, of course, happening again. WHO. Yeah, WHO, right. Uh, do you see any long-lasting effect of this elevated role for Taiwan? I mean, I guess, well, quick comments from Susan and also Debbie, who's dealt with this for many years also, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Taiwan did very well. Of course, it helps to be an island. Um, and uh, I was just reading something from Taiwan Media this morning. They're squabbling internally in Taiwan still over, you know, at the beginning of their, they made some missteps too, or they did things that got other people mad. I mean, at the beginning, they banned the export of PPE at the early stage as well, masks, because they didn't want them to be sent to China when they were going to need them. So, you know, this kind of looking after yourself first instinct, they even had it in Taiwan, uh, as well as other countries. But I think it's absolutely outrageous that Taiwan is not in the WHO. I mean, it's uh, 
Taiwan is in the WTO and other international organizations that do not require statehood. And that's the US government position on it. We have advocated that Taiwan should be in the WHO for a very long time. And I think it's, um, you know, I think it would be good if we had an international effort to bring this up again and to isolate China on this issue because it, it shouldn't be kept out of the WHO. It's bad for the health of everybody. Debbie, any quick comment? So Taiwan is an observer at the WHO. It gets to attend all meetings. It can participate in every, absolutely everything. It just doesn't get to vote. And you know how voting is in these UN bodies. It's mostly consensus anyway. So the actual health impacts of Taiwan membership are actually highly questionable. And the health impacts of China deciding to go slow with the WHO would be massive. So the, I mean, you know, it's, it's, I think this is more a question of Taiwan's overall political position in the world and isn't a public health question. And I think there's a lot of arguments that Taiwan's current political position is deeply problematic. But I don't think it's a public health question. And, you know, Canada did great. Um, Singapore is doing very well. Um, you know, you can cherry pick your good example, but I think what they all have in common is the bitter experience of SARS. All right, great. Uh, I'll turn it back to Wendy now to tell us about uh, future uh, webinars that we're going to have. First off, uh, let me, on behalf of everyone on the line, uh, extend my thanks to you, our panelists. Uh, your knowledge and insights are, are so helpful as we try to understand these challenging times. So thank you very much for your time and energy and being here with us today. Um, so as, as the Dean kind of mentioned at the top, if you're new to GPS uh, and perhaps interested in becoming a student, we offer a wide variety of degrees and programming and you can find out more on our website, gps.ucsd.edu. And if we have any employers in the group, especially in these trying times, we'd love your support in providing internships and jobs for our excellently trained students. So if you have any opportunities within your organization, uh, you can contact our career services team and we'd be glad to kind of help you connect the talent. So lastly, um, I wanted to be sure you knew what the next installment of the series was going to be. Um, next Thursday, again at noon Pacific, we're going to talk about how nations respond uh, to the global, the COVID-19 um, impact. Um, in this webinar, we will take a look across nations and see how Japan, India, and other Asian countries outside of China have rolled out their national strategies for containing the pandemic. Uh, we hope you'll join us for that. Once more, thank you, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>